Welcome to this webinar organized by the EU Data Market Study on the common European data spaces and the data economy. I'm David Osimo, Director of Research at the Lisbon Council, who is partner with IDC in this uh, great project analyzing the evolution of the European data economy for the European Commission. I will be chairing today. Let me start with a very well known sentence. Uh, maybe those of you who are more into this field for longer will recognize it. The coolest thing with your data will be done by someone else. Rufus, Rufus Pollock famously said this many years ago regarding open data. Uh, put simply, uh, secondary use of data or the reuse of data by other entities for purpose different from those that were originally collected for is crucial for innovation. And this is what the European Commission is promoting with the European data strategy to create a single market for data. How to do that? Sector specific data spaces are the main tool. And they are being built and they are being developed over the last years to ensure that more data becomes available for the economy and for the society while keeping individuals and companies in control. Uh, this is a flagship goal of the European data strategy, but it's also a challenging goal. Data reuse is notoriously difficult. Uh, why? The reasons are very well known. Lack of trust, legal uncertainty, different, different data standard and documentation, data that are unsuitable for, for the secondary purpose, secondary use. And the European Commission, the European Union has delivered a major regulatory effort to push uh, we have had, uh, well, first the famous regulatory reform, the open data with the open data directive, the various version, but then this European Commission has gone through with very important pieces of legislation, such as the Data Act, the Data Governance Act, the regulation on the health data space. Now, the issue is how do we translate this regulatory effort into innovation? And this is why we are here today, and this is why we focus on health data spaces in particular. I don't think anywhere else data sharing is more important than in health. Just think about it. A Moderna uh, could start to develop the vaccine on 10th of January 2020, 10th of January, immediately after it was posted on biological.org. So it's clear that data reuse by other is crucial to both the economy and the society. Also, uh, and for this reason, health is arguably the most advanced data space. Uh, it's the one where mainly, basically we are piloting this, this new approach. So it's also a learning opportunity for all other data space. The European Commission has launched originally 10, but then even more data spaces, sector-based data spaces. So. We are all uh, eager to learn from, from health. And it's also important because it's very sensitive data, you know, both for people, for individuals, health data, and for companies. I don't think uh, there is any sector who is more IPR intensive than the pharmace pharmaceutical sector. It's really a, a very important, but also very delicate area. So we really need to get it right. And this is why we're hosting this webinar to learn about the status of, of the European data strategy and in particular to learn about the progress of the health data spaces. Uh, and in fact, uh, let me share the screen again. We have a great lineup today uh, and you have seen it in the invitation and that's why so many of you are here. Um, obviously I have started, as you can see. Then we have Johan Bodenkamp. Uh, from DigiConnect, uh, the data unit, telling us about European data strategy and the status of European data spaces. We then move into the health uh, data space, first with an overview from Sylvia Pi from IDC Health Insight, linking and framing how the data space play a role in the overall uh, health data economy. And then Peya Ramo, Chief Specialist from FinData, this flagship initiative from the Finnish government to 
favor secondary use of data in the health sector, the one that basically everyone is studying as a case study of how to share data in the health sector. We talk about their implementation of the health data space from their perspective. And then we go back to the big picture. How does this fit into the overall uh, data market and data economy? And Giorgio Micheletti, who is the project manager and the leader, the coordinator of the, of the project of the EU data market, will reconnect and frame how data spaces fit into the European uh, data economy. So uh, without further ado, I don't want to take much more time. We will now move on to the speaker. Just let me first uh, remind you a couple of technical things. This is an interactive webinar. Uh, you can uh, post questions to the function. And we also welcome comments and discussion, peer-to-peer -peer discussion between participants using, using the chat function. So give your contribution. We will get back to the question that we receive first to the European Commission and second to the other speakers. So you can post the questions anytime and we will uh, we will read them, we will share them and we will answer them as much as we can. That's all for now. So let's, without further ado, let me ask Johan, who is here with us from Luxembourg to tell us about the EU data strategy and the EU data spaces. Thank you very much. How is it going? Good morning, everybody. I hope that you can hear I me. I can hear you now. Can you hear me? You are muted. I have unmuted myself. Yeah, we can hear you. You can hear me? Yeah. Thank you very much. So welcome, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with you uh, this morning uh, for this uh, webinar on data spaces and the European data strategy. <laughs> Indeed, my name is Johan Bodenkamp. I'm uh, working at the European Commission at the Data Innovation and Policy Unit in Luxembourg, indeed. And uh, it's my pleasure to give a small presentation on the overall context of the European data strategy and the place of the common European data spaces in, in that strategy uh, before uh, focusing on the important uh, activities of creating and developing the health uh, data space by my colleagues. So I will share my screen now. Um, let me first stop my video to save some bandwidth and please let me know if you can see my slides. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. So I would like to start uh, with um, again uh, the European data strategy which is really the strategic policy document that was uh, published and adopted in February of 2020, so almost two and a half years ago, um, and that is really outlining the ultimate goal of uh, the European Union in the field of data, which is to gradually create a so-called single European market for data or an internal data market. And one has to think of um, ideally data really um, uh, becoming um, what, how to say it, to have data making it flowly, flowing freely within and between the member states of the European Union. And one has to think about, uh, you know, the free movement of persons, goods, uh, capital and services as uh, that was created um, many years ago already with the creation of the single uh, European uh, market. So really, uh, this is the ultimate goal. It's, it's a very ambitious goal. We're, we're, we're not there yet. And in order to gradually arrive at the creation of this internal data market, um, a certain number of legislative initiatives has been taken and I will come to that uh, a bit later at the Data Governance Act, the Data Act or the Implementing Act on High Value Data Sets and at the same time this uh, concept of creating so-called common European data spaces was introduced. Um, in February of this year a, a staff working document has been published at request of the European Council, which also shows that at the highest uh, political level there is a keen interest in um, creating these common European data spaces and uh, where one can see the current state of play 
of the so-called sectoral data spaces. I'll come to that a bit later. And also um, um, how we will try to move on to this ultimate goal of creating a single European market for data. Now, on this slide, you see that the European data strategy, as presented two and a half years ago, has two main strands. On the left hand of the slide, you can see so-called cloud actions to really try to develop um, a uh, successful European cloud infrastructure. And on the right hand side is the several data actions. I will be focusing here only on the right hand side, so on the, the data actions, that is to say the legislative uh, initiatives and the various uh, common European data space initiatives. And the main funding tool um, to help um, uh, create these common European data spaces is the new Digital Europe program. This brand new program uh, that has been starting since uh, since one year that is dedicated solely to digital actions and that is focusing on deployment so to complete the important uh, innovation and research actions that are uh, already funded since a lot of years by Hor Horizon Europe and of course all the actions uh, of the data strategy are complementing and integrating existing private and public initiatives um, one can mention Gaia X, and um, there are many others that are going on. So the idea is really to to have a uh, uh, an overall uh, complementary um, action to establish this uh, internal data market. So I will say first a few words on the so-called legislative actions, and then come later to the common European data space actions. Now on this slide, you can see an overview of the so-called legislative framework that we have put in place in the last years and that we are currently still putting in place and that is really focusing on data. Um, you see that each act, reg regulation, directive, is trying to tackle a specific element, let's say, of uh, data, data sharing, data reuse, um, in order to, to have together a comprehensive horizontal framework that should um, uh, allow data to be uh, used, reused and to flow freely within the borders of the European Union member states. So the Data Act is really focusing on trying to ensure fairness in the allocation of data value among the actors of the data economy. The Digital Markets Act that you have uh, certainly heard of is trying to tackle the imbalances that are caused by so-called gatekeepers. Um, the Data Governance Act that has been adopted already is focusing on um, improving the trust um, in the data transactions. And as was already mentioned in the introduction, most of you will know the Open Data Directive that is really trying to open up as much as possible uh, public sector data for use and reuse by everyone. And then the combined free flow of data and the GDPR um, acts are trying to uh, ensure as much as possible the free, free flow of data, be it um, personal data, and there the GDPR, of course, is, uh, I think, well known and tries to um, establish a framework on how this can be done while preserving um, uh, the, the, the personal data um, elements as is important for us in the European Union and for non-personal data there is this specific free flow of data regulation and then if necessary there can be so-called vertical legislation specific le legislation for certain sectors and one can think of for example the automotive sector. Now here on this slide, you can see that, let's say the current um, important acts that we are working on, um, um, on the left-hand side, the open data directive with the so-called high value data sets or the digital, uh, the data governance act. These two acts are trying to um, really open up data, make more data available for everybody uh, for use, reuse, to create uh, innovation, to create new services and to serve the data economy and the, the general public. So um, the open data directive um, is, and the high value data sets is really trying to make sure that data that is already paid for by the public purse is made available. 
the Data Governance Act is, for example, uh, putting in place um, a framework for so-called neutral data intermediaries so that you can bring demand and supply of data more easily together. And then you see on the right-hand side that uh, the proposal of the Data Act and then uh, the Digital Market Act is more focusing on correcting market imbalances. Uh, so the, the Digital Market Act on how the gatekeepers should use and make available certain data without uh, the possibility to uh, use their market power um, in, in a way that uh, is not uh, uh, wished for. And then again, the GDPR and the free flow of data uh, acts are already in place and together combined try to ensure data relevant data protection, but uh, with this data protection to ensure as much as possible the free, free flow of data across the board, across uh, borders. Now, without going too much into detail, just a few words on the three uh, important, uh, uh, let's say, acts. So this Open Data Directive has this implementing act, which is to um, establish a concrete list of high value data sets, that is to say data sets that have a very high socioeconomic uh, uh, value. And you see in, in six um, domains, you see them on the left-hand side, geospatial, et cetera. And to make sure that these data sets then will be made available for free in machine readable formats and via, via APIs, and if relevant, as bulk downloads. So this is really trying to boost as much as possible um, the availability of high value data sets. Now, the Data Governance Act that is to be um, applicable in less than one year, as from September next year, is focusing on four pillars. First of all, it tries to establish a framework for the reuse of so-called sensitive data held by public sector bodies. Uh, where the Open Data Directive is really um, trying to open up public sector data that is not sensitive. Sensitive data, uh, including personal data or, or sensitive business data, could be reused under certain, in, under certain conditions um, in a um, uh, trustful way. And this uh, pillar is trying to uh, open that up. Then the second pillar is uh, the, the creation of these so-called neutral data intermediaries to really um, act as a data broker and to facilitate the, uh, the supply and the demand of data. The third pillar is focusing on data altruism and to allow uh, for a certain framework with the creation of a register of data altruism organizations uh, to have um, um, data offered by the general public or by corporates uh, for the for the public uh, good. And finally, the fourth pillar is the creation of a so-called European Data Innovation Board uh, composed of member states and several working groups to um, coordinate all the various actions and to also focus on the important um, uh, characteristic of making everything interoperable. Now, the Data Act proposal, that is to say, um, uh, it's a proposal because for the moment uh, it has not been adopted yet. It is discussed uh, by the co-legislators uh, at the moment, so by European Parliament and European Council, is trying to allow for better access of so-called IoT data, the Internet of Things data, automated data that are uh, being created um, in huge amounts by so-called intelligent uh, uh, machines, for example, um, allowing also for users of those objects to get right um, uh, to access those data, to port the data, and also for third parties uh, to uh, offer services uh, on the base, based on those data. So it's really trying to open up uh, these IoT data and to um, ensure a fair use and reuse of those data, not only by the manufacturers uh, that are creating the objects. Um, I will maybe not continue on the other elements that you can read for timing issues. And I will switch over to the other part of the data strategy, data actions, which is the creation of the common European data spaces. Now, what is the data space? There is not a fixed, clear definition uh, because we would like to uh, keep that a bit more flexible. But in the staff working document of February of this year, a certain number of key elements were uh, characteristics were uh, published. And uh, um, the, the two main elements that uh, make 
uh, a space, a so-called data space, is to have on the one hand a secure and privacy preserving IT infrastructure that allows you to pool, access, process, use and share data and to combine that with a well-functioning data governance mechanism. That is to say the whole set of rules that allows people to use and share data in a trustful and transparent manner. So it's not only legislation, but also administrative rules, contractual rules, but the whole set of rules that allows you to understand under what conditions you can use uh, data. Of course, there should be big amounts of data available for a data space to be uh, uh, useful. And uh, the idea is also that participation is by an open number of organizations uh, as uh, soon as uh, they comply with the rules um, of the data space. Now, indeed, as mentioned uh, in the beginning already, the data strategy has announced the importance of creating these so-called common European data spaces and has um, identified um, data spaces in various sectors that are considered of uh, important strategic uh, uh, importance so for the European Union. So of course health but also industrial and manufacturing, agriculture, finance, mobility, the Green Deal, energy, public administrations and skills. And in order to back that up and to gradually develop these common European data spaces, a data spaces support center is being set up that is to coordinate the development of those data spaces and to ensure common standards and interoperability. And all this based on a so-called technical infrastructure. In the staff working document, a certain number of important design principles was also um, has also been um, put forward that you see here on the slide data control relevant data governance the importance of interconnection and interoperability to use as much as possible a common technical data infrastructure to have openness to all sectors sorry to all actors that respect uh, the rules of course, the respect of the well-known EU rules and values. And um, yes, as I said, with the data control to ensure that uh, the data spaces also uh, contain tools that actually allow easy pooling, accessing and reuse of, uh, of data. So what we try to accomplish with the data strategy in general and with the specific data uh, space actions in particular is to um, go from the so-called closed ec ecosystems that exist, of course, through open ecosystems, finally to a federation of ecosystems. You see here on the slide, um, you know that you have the participants, you can be a data uh, provider, you can be a data user, you can be both. And then uh, gradually um, there will be also this new function of neutral data intermediaries that is really trying to, to bring uh, supply and demand together uh, without uh, you know, being um, itself uh, also a data provider or, or a data user. So to really facilitate um, uh, the supply and the demand side of data. And finally, with the federation to ensure that the various ecosystems are connected, are interconnected, and that with the uh, gradually we go from a certain number of sectoral data spaces to this so-called internal data market at EU level. Now, the data spaces, uh, the common European data spaces um, are uh, specifically um, promoted also uh, by the so-called digital program. And you see here that a certain number of calls of last year and also this year have addressed mostly preparatory actions for data spaces in the various sectors that you see on the slide. And uh, this means um, uh, really to, to uh, uh, create the main building blocks, um, the main elements on the basis of which uh, the data spaces are going to be developed and deployed. So one has to think of uh, creating uh, a network of stakeholders uh, on creating a blueprint architecture for those data spaces uh, on identifying important data sets that should be part of these data spaces. 
And as mentioned a bit earlier, and a very important um, a transversal preparatory action was the setup or is the setup of the Data Spaces Support Center. It has started a few weeks ago. And um, they, this support center will closely work with the various sectoral preparatory actions. We'll also, um, together with those sectoral data spaces, identify common requirements and in that sense also work together with this envisaged European Data Innovation Board and of course create a platform in order to uh, make available the knowledge, to exchange the knowledge, best practices, etc. to support the deployment of the data spaces. Now there are four data space uh, calls uh, that are currently open um, for manufacturing, media, mobility and smart communities and you see that here there's already a focus on deployment so it's like a continuation of the previous preparatory actions or the ones that have started now in order to um, once the basis has been uh, prepared to start developing and deploying those sectoral data spaces. So where do we stand now? Just to sum up, for the High Value Datasets uh, Implementing Act um, in December of this year, there will be a, the submission uh, of the so-called uh, High Value Datasets that have been identified for opinion to the Open Data Committee. It is expected to be adopted in the first quarter of next year, and then it should be applicable in the course of 2024. The Data Governance Act was adopted already and as I mentioned earlier will be applying from September of next year. The Data Act is a current proposal that is discussed in co-decision by European Parliament and Council and we hope that there will be an adoption in the course of next year. The various uh, common uh, European data spaces, the preparatory activities are currently launched. So um, the successful projects have started, um, let's say, uh, in September uh, or in this, is in this month. It's uh, actions that last for uh, uh, 18 months approximately. And then uh, the first deployment actions should be starting next year. And finally, uh, we are working on the next work program of the Digital Europe funding program, that is to say the one uh, for the years 23 and 24, uh, that should be adopted in the first quarter of next year, and the first call of that new work program should be in quarter two. And that is all for me, from me, from my, uh, from, uh, for the moment, and I'm uh, happy to answer questions if you would have any. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johan. Uh, fantastic overview. Uh, we will, uh, I'm sure people will watch it again because it's really uh, gives you a comprehensive uh, overview and very complete. We have one question, and we're running. We don't have much time, but I think we have time for one question. I don't know if you can see, but uh, will the all the four C nine data spaces have the same requirements in terms of architecture? I imagine our agriculture won't have the same sensitive element as health. So what are the differences? What is what is common? And this is, it is a question from Alexander Lucas in Estec, who wins the prize for the first question. Nice question. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So thank you very much for the question. It's, an, it's a very important one. No, um, not all the data spaces will have exactly the same uh, features indeed. Uh, the, the sectors have uh, different features. And this is also where the various preparatory actions that are now starting for agriculture, for manufacturing, uh, for uh, the Green Deal, are uh, also to work on this issue together with the Data Spaces Support Center. The, the, the main idea is as much as possible to have the common technical framework in place for uh, all the data spaces and where necessary to have specific characteristics and features for each data space uh, on top of that to make uh, the data space work in uh, the specific uh, sector. So indeed uh, for the health data space for which we will have a lot of uh, useful information in a second, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, you know, it's, it's very sensitive. Uh, it's, it's, um, uh, it, it, it cannot be seen at the same level as, uh, for example, uh, again, the, the, the agricultural uh, data space. And then, um, for example, the Green Deal data space has yet another challenge because the Green Deal is not a very specific sector as manufacturing, energy or agriculture. It's transversal. 
and therefore um, this data space will also of course need to have very important links with the other data spaces because uh, many elements cover also the objectives of the green deal but also in terms of setting up the infrastructure this transversal nature will need to be taken into account that's great i have an additional question myself i'm curious i'm curious uh, do you have any do you envisage any monitoring in terms of how much they are used, how much traction they have? Do you have any metrics to, to observe whether these data spaces gain uh, participants, gain uh, data sharing, down, data downloads? I don't know what metrics you might use, but do you have any idea on that? Yes, um, so the various preparatory actions of the sectoral data space, they do have KPIs, uh, key performance indicators, so very uh, concrete in order to see uh, to what extent the objectives are being uh, uh, obtained, including, uh, you know, the availability and the identification of specific data sets, the use, um, uh, uh, to what extent the, the various stakeholders of the sector are being uh, part of the network. And then again, the Data Spaces Support Center will have a very, very important role there to play because uh, they really will be uh, uh, functioning as, as a key central element in overseeing the coordination including also you know to what extent really these data spaces are um, you know um, uh, being pre prepared developed and are actually being used uh, and interconnected excellent now people are starting asking questions let me see if, uh... first question from Kali Cook a data space for all data spaces is there uh, how does it work the federation between of them do we need one additional one transversal one <laughs> yeah so the idea is that these um that the various so-called sectoral data spaces that have been put forward in the data strategy are all going to be interconnected and in the end what with the connection of the sectoral data spaces and other uh, sectoral data spaces or thematic data spaces that will be uh, created in the in the coming times because indeed as you said uh, yourself David I mean the the sectoral data spaces proposed by the the data strategy is the start it's a certain number of sectors that are considered of uh, most um, uh, importance in the European Union but there are so many more and let's not forget about the creation of data space structures that have been taking place already in the private sector i mean um, they exist they function they are being developed and the idea is to gradually all bring these initiatives together uh, in order to form one single data space um, so um, this one single data space could be then considered to be a data space of the data spaces but it's really the connection of the various data spaces that should form together um, you know, the, 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 the internal data market that we envisage. And I think we should, you know, one could think uh, with a very simple image of the creation of our road and navigation system in the various countries, you know, with highways, with little roads, with, with, with roads for pedestrians and for cycles that should not stop at the borders, they should be interconnected and all these roads together for ships, for planes, air, air roads and for cars and for cycles and for pedestrians, they will all together create our uh, mobility infrastructure, right? Right. Excellent. Um, now, uh, we have many other questions. I just want to ask one more. It's a practical question. Uh, Digital Europe, 50% funding. So are there mechanisms to provide additional funding from the member states or joint research programs? How does it work? This is from Richard Stevens of IDC. Yes, thank you. Um... Absolutely. So one of the features of the Digital Europe program is that it allows to combine um, uh, various funding sources. So indeed, uh, for uh, for various actions, the funding is 50 percent, and it is expected that uh, the, the participants in the projects um, uh, find uh, contribute uh, the other 50 percent of funding. And this can be done in various ways, including, uh, for example, um, uh, national funding programs or other uh, 
European instruments that are there or are in the course of being set up. Um, so it, it is absolutely possible uh, to combine that. And this is even the objective of, of uh, let's say, one of the objectives of the Digital Euro Programme, to, to have a comprehensive funding uh, framework. So digital is one part of it, but the other uh, instruments that exist at European and national level can be used and should be used as well, apart from, of course, uh, contributions from the participants, the companies themselves. Excellent. I'll leave the other question for after the discussion, since they're more top content related, and I will move now rapidly to Silvia. Silvia Piai will tell us more about the future of digital health and data-driven healthcare and how data spaces fit into it. Thank you very much, David. And once again, thank you everyone for joining. It's, it's a pleasure being here with you today. Okay, let me share my screen as well. And you know, as David as David said, I'm going to really give you an overview of the uh, European health data space and try to explain why is it so important for the future of healthcare, European healthcare and life science. Johan already explained very well how from where. European health data uh, space stands for and what is the relationship within the broader European health data strategy. So I won't duel into that, but uh, let's try to define it a little bit better because the European health data space, because of the sensitive nature of healthcare data is, uh, is, a, bit is a bit special. So the European health data space, as defined by the Commission proposal, which was published last May, is a health-specific ecosystem comprised of rule, common standards and practice, infrastructure, and a governance framework that aims to empower individuals in securing, accessing, and controlling their data, and supporting, of course, their free movement by being able to receive healthcare everywhere in Europe, but it's also aimed at overcoming the uncertainties that today hinder secondary use of healthcare, info, of healthcare data and bringing it at greater scale to support research, policy making, innovation, and education. And finally, this will help to unleash the potential of the health data economy. Um, the, the European health data space is split into main, two domain domains, the primary and secondary use of data. And while these two domains are strongly intertwined and of course need to be harmonized, they entail specific governance frameworks, specific requirements uh, for data quality, for data standardization, and of course also some specific infrastructure and capability that are going to be developed at European level and at member state and local and local level. When we talk about primary use, and I know that actually we we'll, oh, today we'll be focusing mostly on secondary use, but it's really important because actually of the nature of healthcare data and also because of the nature of the digital healthcare market in Europe. Um, the, when we talk about primary use of European in the European health data space, we really look into giving more control to individual over their electronic personal health data. And this is possible as the European health data space fosters a generally single market for electronic health record systems, for the relevant medical devices, and for the high risk AI system that support clinical decision and healthcare workflows. The scope of uh, the health data space here is really to standardize and harmonize e-health services and products and facilitate the interaction of patients with the healthcare providers across the whole year. And this will be done through the definition of a European um, electronic health record format and a governance framework for really the evolution and the update of standards, uh, interoperability requirements, as well as the definition of the lawful use cases, the security requirement. So it will really develop, develop a structure approach uh, to um, scale the required digital capabilities and skills, uh, which at the end uh, will be leading to 
things like the standardization and the certification of the electronic health record uh, system, uh, system and solution that are available in, in Europe. And more on a voluntary basis, also uh, in proposing a labeling for wellness and healthcare hub. And this will help to increase the trust of citizens toward uh, those uh, digital health services. Um, talking about the initiatives and the projects uh, for about primary use within the, the European health data space, we obviously refer to the My Health at EU, which is really the health digital services infrastructure, which already supports two main services, which is the patient summary and the e-prescription and the e-dispensation. These services are planned to be further expanded in order to include a broader set of uh, information and type of healthcare data, including, uh, for example, medical imaging, discharge letter, laboratory results. And for this, the commission has sponsored the XE Health Project, which really builds upon the patient summary and is setting the foundation for a usable, let's say, or workable, interoperable and secure electronic health record exchange format that will be used to support patient pathways locally, of course, but also the cross-border exchange of data. And this is really, this deep dive into the primary use case, in primary use of data is very important because really sets also the foundation and, you know, helps to increase the potential of the secondary use. And here, the European health data space really aims to provide a consistent, trustworthy, and efficient setup for using all the available data for the purposes that I've also mentioned before. So research, innovation, policy making, and uh, edu education. And this is probably the element of novelty brought by the European health data space as cross-border sharing of health data for secondary use has been so far very much project-based and currently there are no common legal basis or practices for the uh, secondary use of healthcare data across Europe. So to efficiently enable the reuse of healthcare data by the researcher, by the policymakers, and also by the industry, the European Union is really looking to create this decentralized infrastructure based on a network of nodes that will be the entry point to uh, the healthcare data space. And um, these nodes will be then the national authorization body complemented by uh, other um, authorized health data, data holders as for instance, the European uh, Medicine Agency. Obviously here in developing this space, uh, there will be a focus on a number of areas, uh, for example, into expanding and integrating the already existing infrastructure that are available for data exchange in member states or also defining what are the rules for interoperability, for data quality, which is actually an important issue, an important part in order to determine the safety and the quality of the product and the services that are developed using the European health data space. And of course, it will be also defining what are the privacy and security requirements. Here, the initiatives uh, are starting to, 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 uh, to becoming uh, more and more, but there are, and there are several projects and consortia that uh, has been approved and are starting to pilot into this secondary use of data. But definitely we, we would like to mention the Darwin project, which is the data analysis and real world uh, uh, interrogation network, uh, which is coordinated by the European Medicine Agency, which will deliver real world evidence across Europe on the use, safety and effectiveness of the medicine. This is very important because it will connect the European to the European health data spaces to expand on the type of data and in use cases that can be supported, providing further depth and further reach within the industry. Uh, David earlier on mentioned the importance for the pharmaceutical, for the medical device company to really get access to those data to, uh, to, dr to drive innovation and, and new discovery. As a second example, of course, we are, uh, we are mentioning the European Health Data Space Pilot Consortium, which has been uh, recently awarded and is led by the French Health Data Hub. 
and is composed of 16 partners from all over Europe uh, to build and test a first version of the uh, health data space for secondary use of data. Um, the, the, the pilot will last for two years and will test nine uh, use cases with concrete research question to demonstrate the transformational potential of uh, uh, the European health data space. And among the partners of this project, there is also uh, FinData, which we have to have the pleasure later on. So I'm sure you will hear more in depth on, on this in, in, in a minute. But coming up really to why European health data space is so topical to the broader transformation of the health and life science sector. Well, if you look at what are the top strategic priorities for European health providers and life science organization, we can clearly see how almost all of them really depends upon the capabilities and the principle that build the European health data space. Our research at IDC showed that over the last two years, the organization able to use and exchange data were those that also were able to show greater resilience to the pandemic disruption. The pandemic actually further reinforced the necessity for healthcare organization to evolve toward value-based models where patients and population clinical outcomes are measured against a triple bottom line of environmental, social, and economic costs and impact. This really determine a, a need for greater data, greater data access. And also uh, it's clear that uh, each individual organization cannot act in isolation. And therefore there is a higher, it's required a higher degree of collaboration, information sharing, and really continuous exchange of insights. So to ensure that healthcare systems will continue to provide equitable access to high quality, personalized and sustainable healthcare services. Uh, because actually, as we know, this will be the biggest challenge for uh, healthcare system, healthcare system for a while, equitable access to high quality and, uh, and economically viable healthcare services. And to this, the participation of innovative ecosystem is becoming almost a precondition. And once again, looking at the results that I'm showing, I'm sharing here with, with you, um, it's, quite striking how, the, how our research shows that the concepts of secure data platform, interoperability, and digital capabilities sharing are the first action item to support ecosystem-driven innovation. So if successfully implemented, the health data space will help addressing some of the barriers for health and life science digital transformation data management, data integration, data standardization, as well as data quality, really continue to hamper digital innovation. And also the concern over data protection compliance are mentioned as the top reason for digital project leading, uh, leading for digital project to fail. So the European health data space not only provide the infrastructure, but also a common policy framework that helps to build the necessary boundaries to deliver safe, ethical, and compliant innovation. Moreover, the funding allocated at UL level and also within the member states recovery and resilience plan really drives the long-awaited modernization of digital health infrastructure at very local level, really helping the sector to finally leverage some of the benefits offered by technologies as cloud, AI, and uh, edge, edge platforms, so to make those data available and usable. However, the same opportunities that we have seen that are offered by the health data space can Sylvia, also turn Sylvia. into a challenge. Yes. Sylvia, can you wrap up? We're yeah, uh, that's before. the final slide. Right. And, uh, and I won't go into the, all the further details, but for example, the national regulation needs to be further harmonized because despite the effort, 
fragmentation is still very high when it comes to health data space. And uh, this can be successful only if there is a high level of trust and there are actually tools that are easy to use for citizens to actually exercise their, uh, their rights over, over the, their data. And it's also important to connect to international standardization and interoperability efforts, really trying to balance the effort to achieve digital sovereignty, which is obviously uh, an important objective across Europe, but also to ensure access to other markets for the uh, for the, healthcare in, the digital healthcare industry in Europe, and also access to innovative solutions for the European healthcare providers. This will actually help to build the long-term sustainability and making it the underlying business models able to adapt to the evolution of the technology, but also to the social and an economical landscape. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, um, yeah, that was great. Uh, you were too long, but it was so interesting I couldn't stop you. <laughs> so uh, thanks a lot, especially the data points were uniquely insightful. It's clear this is super important. It's very difficult. There are a lot of challenges still ahead. Uh, let's look at it from the let's say. Uh, user perspective, uh, if we can use this word, PEIA uh, is uh, part of FinData, one of the flagship initiatives and national level, and is part of the European health data space. What can you tell us? How does it work? What are, how do we overcome this challenge? And please be sure, because we're running a bit late. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me see. I'll share my screen and go directly to my presentation. Just say something if you can't see my presentation, but I trust you to see it. So I'm, uh, I'm Beja Harmo from FinData, and uh, my presentation outline is here. I tell you briefly about the legal basis for our work, uh, something about our work in a nutshell, then uh, our viewpoints to the EHDS proposal, and then about FinData's role in EHDS preparations. So the legal basis, the cornerstones for secondary use in Finland. Uh, well, you know, obviously, in, in the Nordic countries, we have rich national data registers with long timer series, which have in practice 100% coverage of the Finnish population in Finland. Uh, we use the opt out principle in secondary use of social and health data, so consent is not required for registry based research. Uh, and obviously also in the nudic countries, we have the personal identity codes, which uh, work as a key to linking personal information from all, all different registers. Uh, in Finland, we also have a high trust on government and authorities. Uh, people trust that they have transparent op operation. Uh, people trust on benefits gained from research as a better healthcare, for example, uh, and they trust also on data security and data safety, which we take very seriously, obviously. So uh, the actual legal basis for the secondary use in Finland has been the act, which became uh, into effect in, in May 2019. And the idea of the act is to streamline and secure the secondary use of social and health data, and obviously also to meet the requirements of the GDPR. Uh, the act prescribes FinData services, steering and supervision, and it gives FinData the authority to grant permissions for secondary use uh, of Finnish health and social data. The status of FinData is that it is an independent authority, uh, although it's positioned in, in Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare. We are a non-profit governmental organization. So what do we then do with this legal back, backbone? Uh, well, we, we handle the applications for the secondary use of social and healthcare data. We, we grant the permits. Then we collect uh, the data from the original data controllers. We link the data sets. Uh, we pseudonymize the data. In some cases, we anonymize it. Uh, then, we, when, then we put the data, transfer the data in a secure remote access environment for data analysis. Uh, Capsel is our own uh, remote access environment, but there are currently already uh, seven other audited uh, secure environments in Finland that can be also used. And then we also have a help desk kind of covering this all. We, we, we give advice to our clients, but also to, to data controllers. And the data can be applied also outside Finland, everywhere in the world, you can send applications to, to us. And uh, we have our website and our application portal in three languages, in Finnish, Swedish, and English. 
So welcome to check it out. Uh, we also process applications and permits on behalf of the controllers, also in the case of single data controller. And we also uh, aim for a national covering uh, metadata catalog. So we support the preparation of data descriptions, which the data controller controllers themselves have to do. Uh, very briefly about our operations, so you can see the scale of our operations. Uh, the year 2021 was the first whole year of our operations. We will soon have the figures also for from this year, but now this is from the last year. We received altogether over uh, 300 applications. Uh, we made 262 decisions. Uh, the vast uh, majority of them are for individual level data. We also grant permits for aggregated level data, but most of them are for individual level data, and most of them are obviously for scientific research. Here you can see the, our applicants. Uh, two thirds of them are from public sector, uh, almost one third of them from private sector, and then a small percentage from third sector. And all our issued permits uh, are openly available. You can see the, not very detailed, but you can go to our website and you can see the titles of the projects. You can see the, the, the recipients of the permits. So it's, it's very interesting for me. Uh, my background is in epidemiological research and very nice to see the kind of what, what kind of research is done with the brilliant finished data. So what do we see as the key challenges so far in our work and, and which, what could be seen also as a kind of in, in examples and kind of warnings for the, for the next uh, uh, places uh, trying to open up the similar one-stop shop? Well, obviously it has been a big uh, systemic change and a learning process for all parties involved. And we have been doing a lot of ironing out the wrinkles in the cooperation between ourselves, FinData as, a, as the data access body but also our clients, the data users, and the data control controllers. So there are three parties, at least, in, in, in each application working together. Uh, there have been very high expectations in Finland and also demand during the ramp up. And, and there is obviously an understandable client criticism regarding application handling times and pricing, for example. And, and of course, it's necessary to have sufficient resources and, and learning process also for us and leaning processes, we have been doing that too, to, to make the handling times quicker. And also uh, we work towards more transparency in data pricing. Data controllers can determine their prices independently, so we don't have much say in that, but at least the prices maybe should, should uh, come a bit more kind of similar and also at least more transparent to the client. There is huge variety in the data types applied for and the analysis methods planned to be used with them. So that requires great adaptability from the data access body and preparedness to take this variation into account when processing first the application and then the data themselves. Uh, briefly about uh, our views on the EHDS proposal comparing to the Finnish Act. Well, obviously there are lots of similarities. The Finnish Act has been used as a source when drafting the, the EU proposal. And the, we obviously hope that this means that the implementation of EHDS should be, or at least could be, hopefully, easier in Finland compared to many other countries, but let's see. But there are, of course, also differences between the proposal and the Finnish Act. For example, there are more data sources listed in the EHDS proposal uh, compared with the Act. There are more purposes for which electronic health data can be processed for secondary use. There are many more tasks for the health data access bodies, and there are new duties also for the data holders. And of course, big new thing, the cross-border access to data. Uh, we see lots of benefits in the proposal of overall. It's obviously a very good goal, but uh, the, and the infrastructure and the ground rules proposed for the EHDS would improve the preconditions of secondary use of health data in Europe and it would facilitate research projects willing to combine data from several countries. There are things that need to be considered carefully. Uh, we all know there is a large variation between the European countries in the availability of electronic health data and the preparedness to deliver them to data users. Uh, the data access bodies will need an independent status and adequate resources to be able to uh, do all the tasks. 
the data protection and uh, data security are essential and we need EU level standards there. Rules and responsibilities related to compensations must be very clear. And there are some time limits suggested in the EHD proposal that are not so, so that don't seem so kind of work so well. And then very briefly, I think this is my last slide about our participation in EU funded projects, FinData. Uh, we are participating in the TEHDAS joint action, uh, which has been now already, it's kind of halfway through, it will end next summer. And there are 25 European countries involved and the coordinator for this is, is Finnish Citra. And, and Silvia already told you about the EHDS2 pilot, uh, and we are also partnering there and a task leader. Uh, in a task developing a common data access application form. And, and actually there were uh, nine use cases shortlisted, but in the end, five use cases selected. But that's a minor detail. We are very interested in seeing how they go. Okay, but that's, that's from me right now, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Wonderful, and thanks. This was an amazing presentation. I wish uh, you, you really are setting a standard and, and seeing so many things just in how you deliver this short to the point with a lot of data on uptake. I hope this KPI will be part of the new data spaces, the application KPI that you showed, open about the challenges. So thank you so much. Uh, it's really it's really inspiring. And thanks for, for respecting the time. Now we have a, a, one last presentation and uh, we will get back with the question. I'm, we are gathering the question. So feel free to, to ask them, but we will go, go back to them at the end. Giorgio, what can you tell us? How does this fit into the big picture of the EU data market? Yes, so let me share my slide. Thank you. Thank you, David, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, so very quickly, because I understand we are running um, out of time, and we are lucky because I prepared some slides that were actually already covered quite well uh, in the previous presentations and especially by um, by Johan. So I'm not going through those slides. Let me share the screen. Right, I hope you can. Um, you can see my screen and uh, precisely, David, the the purpose that I have today in a few minutes is to make the link between what has been said and done about the, uh, the, 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 the common European data spaces and the digital strategy, of course, but let's say that, let's focus on the data spaces and the, the current status and future status of the uh, European data economy. Now, the project, um, the, the, this specific webinar, as you remembered, uh, as you reminded at the beginning of this, this webinar, um, is actually uh, occurring uh, within uh, the framework of the European uh, Data Market Study. So this is an endeavor that uh, IDC and the Lisbon Council have been um, carrying out for quite a few years. This is the third edition um, for the uh, data unit of uh, DG Connect in Luxembourg. And in, in this endeavor, we are measuring uh, the current and future status of the European data market and the data economy. So what is the relationship? What will happen uh, if these um, data spaces are implemented, uh, let's say, in the right way, if the uh, supporting legislation is implemented um, as expected? Now, um, I will skip this slide again because I, I said we um, we have already covered the definition of data spaces. We have already uh, spoken about the key elements of data spaces. We have already seen what's going on in the, uh, I call it here, developing environment. So we have different initiatives, projects. We've spoken about um, the Digital Europe program. We've spoken about the different uh, preparatory actions um, supporting now the, the creation of this uh, of this environment. By the way, we are uh, directly involved in some of these preparatory actions, and especially the Green Deal one. Um, but let's go to the to the uh, to the study itself. Now, the European Data Market Study um, measures uh, the status of the data market and the data economy um, uh, now uh, for 2021-2022 but also in the future at 2025 and 2030. Now, and we are doing this according to three different scenarios. Um, there is, of course, a baseline scenario, so 
to say the, the famous uh, if nothing has is if nothing is is being done there is an eye growth scenarios when when assumptions are that uh, legislation has been implemented correctly that data spaces for example are deployed uh, in time and and correctly and, and and bring the results that they are supposed to bring there is a challenge scenarios where external uh, where these things are not happening and where uh, additional external uh, macroeconomic or, or uh, unforeseeable uh, events happen and of course uh, they worsen the whole the whole situation now if we look um the assumptions on which these these scenarios are built there are policy and regulatory assumptions there are uh, business assumptions per se and there are uh, global trends right so the macroeconomy uh, the war uh, uh, the inflations and, and, and so on. Among the the and, and within the, the policy and regulatory assumptions, this is where they, um, as we have seen today, especially at the beginning in the presentation uh, from the European Commission from Johan Bodenkamp, we've seen that there are some policy and regulatory uh, and regulatory uh, uh, actions that have a direct impact on uh, common European data spaces. And if we take uh, some of the policy regulatory assumptions that we have used uh, in our uh, study and in our model, uh, we can see at least, it, it, this is my sentiment and our, our idea that some of them, like especially the two ones that I've highlighted here, so the data strategy per se, but in the sense of making Europe a global leader uh, and a data agile economy, and also the development of, of an effective data governance framework, that can, this is, clearly directly linked um, to the deployment of, of, of the data spaces. These two assumptions are uh, dependent also on, um, on, on, on the way data spaces uh, are being and will be, uh, will be implemented uh, in the future. And the result of all of this, just to give you a, a, a a quick uh, and, and, and let's say a, a flavor of, of, of the overall works of science. These are some of the indicators that this study, uh, the European data market study measures and will continue to measure over the next uh, one and a half, two years. Uh, I've highlighted here uh, three of them. So the data market itself, which is the market of products and services that are based on uh, data. So data that are actually exchanged uh, as we've seen. There is the effect that this data market has on the overall economy, uh, what we call the data economy. So essentially, we can measure this also in terms of uh, uh, our share of GDP, right? So uh, how much this is contributing to the GDP of uh, the European Union and, and, and uh, each individual member states, for example. And there is the data monetization. This is very important. So this is the actual revenue. It's the stream of revenue that companies and, and organizations that are exchanging data are making by actually selling, so monetizing these data. Its data can be exchanged, can be exchanged also uh, versus uh, and against uh, against a, a monetary uh, retribution and so on. So, if you look at these uh, these measures, and if you look at, at our projections, not just for 2021 because that's the that's the last year, uh, and, and, and we are now providing and we will provide um, in next month, we will have the new data for 2022. But if we look at the projections for uh, 2030 and you look at the three scenarios, you see that there is a, a big difference, right? So meaning um, if uh, the high growth scenarios is actually uh, becoming a reality, so if the assumptions are gathered and met that bring together and bring about the the actual deployment of the uh, growth scenarios then uh, things are moving fast and becoming quite uh, positive and significant for the eu27 these data are eu27 uh, by the way right so the data market will increase substantially uh, it will basically double from 2021 uh, to 2030 if the high growth scenarios is is is, uh, is becoming a reality uh, the data economy will also more than double, so the, there is a multiplier effect. Uh, if the data market is there, then uh, the effect on the, on the data economy is even greater. And data monetization, which at the moment is only something like 
25% uh, uh, of the overall uh, size of the data market will become higher. Uh, the, the share of the data monetization per se will become something like 30% or even more uh, under the high growth uh, scenario uh, in, in 2030. So this is to say that uh, in the, the, the social implications uh, that have been highlighted for the actual implementation of uh, common European data spaces are there, are very important, but there are also economic uh, implications uh, in terms of the data economy, of the evolutions uh, of the data economy. And this could be a fundamental stepping stone, I would say, to, uh, to make Europe a, um, a, a, a great and, and solid data economy vis-a-vis -vis other regions of the world. And with this note, David, I am Thanks. I'm finished. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Uh, we're almost finished. Uh, we don't have much time, but I, I really want to, to answer some of these questions as much as possible. So let's focus on the health data space in particular, question related to this. I'll put uh, four questions. Uh, and who feels like answering, uh, please go ahead first. Um, the health data spaces board, will pharmaceutical companies be included? That's a very straightforward one. What kind of actors do you envisage taking part in? I don't know if Johan or Silvia want to answer this. I would imagine that Silvia is more yeah. <laughs> able so, to answer that question. Well, actually, uh, there is actually a, a discussion and you know if we think about the initiatives that for instance uh, in France has been taken around the, the health data hub we know that there are actually collaboration with pharmaceutical company and life science company there is a call from the industry to be better involved in the decision making and also determining the type of data that should be available and determining the different use cases and lawful use cases and I think it will be important because also of the development of the ethical use of, uh, of, health, uh, of healthcare data. Obviously, we were, when we are talking about secondary use, we are talking about the identified healthcare data, but uh, thinking about specific domains like rare diseases is the most striking one. The, the re-identification can be very easy. So we need to identify along with the industry, along with the best practices that are in the industry, and you know, in this life science can bring also a lot of the, the, the experience into that, uh, to identify what are the best uh, what are the best practices, what are the guidelines. But definitely at this moment, there is a call from the industry, from the life science industry to be better involved. And to be honest, they are involved in many of the projects that are kind of corollary to the European health data space uh, build up. Yeah, I, I don't think it's possible to do a health data space without industry, but that's my view. Yeah, exactly. um, what about uh, a very important question on anonymization? Uh, Ted Koch says there is no clear guidance on anonymization, and this is a major obstacle for data sharing. Uh, he actually mentioned the machine data is regarded often as personal data. I'm not sure what he refers to here, but in general, it's clear that there is demand for more clarity on anonymization. Will there be any, and who will do that? I don't know if, uh, Johan, this is more across data spaces, I think, as a question. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's true that um, there are still many questions that remain on the issue of anonymization, pseudonymization, what does it mean? Uh, when is it actually anonymized? When is it actually pseudonymized, et cetera? And I think that uh, Peya has a, a very hands-on experience in, 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 doing, uh, in doing that. Um, for machine data, uh, it's true that, uh, of course, uh, it can be seen uh, in certain uh, in certain instances as personal data, and there, obviously, uh, GDPR applies, and one needs to uh, depersonalize it, uh, unless there would be consent, of course, uh, to use it also with the personal data uh, characteristics attached to that. Uh, so, for example, if you if you look at intelligent um, measuring sensors in the agricultural field on temperatures, humidity, uh, anything like that, when can one can 
can imagine also that there's a lot that is not necessarily personal data, right? For car data, as soon as you detach it from the car user, the, the person uh, like me driving a car uh, and, the, and the car generates all sorts of data on the functioning of my car and how I use it, etc. cetera, um, you, you can still distill a lot of very, very useful non-personal data out of that. So um, let's say that with the various initiatives that let's say are presented as part of the European data strategy, there is no specific further guidance on anonymization. This is, let's say, uh, part of the GDPR that is already in place since four years. And I think that a lot of uh, progress has been made there already in understanding how you could anonymize something, how you could pseudonymize something. And it's true, of course, that uh, still challenges uh, do exist there. Um, I don't know if Pea, from her uh, practical experience in uh, pseudonymizing and anonymizing data in her field, uh, maybe can add something more practical on that. Well, I don't know if I can add anything. It's it's really as as you said, and you know we have our our guidelines in the act, etc. But we are still all the time debating this, and we always have to find kind of new. There are always new new questions coming towards us, so we need to kind of discuss it at all all times. In any in any case, we have our guidelines, but still kind of new challenges also on on, on this front. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if the Data Innovation Board will have something to say on that. They will certainly have something to say on that. And what should maybe not be forgotten and that, that what will be uh, also could be seen as a certain kind of guidance is the numerous research and innovation projects that are specifically focusing on, you know, performing performant anonymization tools, pseudonymization tools, because of course there's always this question, you know, what level of anonymization or pseudonymization should you get in order to be able to say this is really anonym and you cannot get back to the initial uh, person that makes it still uh, you know not 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 secure and uh, this is really work in progress but let's not forget about about all the research and innovation projects there thanks uh, last question uh, from the german medical association they say to Silvia, but i think it's also for for Jochen, if, if he knows about this, I, uh, as we read the Commission proposal, patients will not have the possibility to opt out of secondary use of their data. I suppose this is the health data space uh, regulation, I wonder. But uh, the question is pretty straightforward. Will patients have the possibility to opt out? We have heard that this is what, what happens in Finland. So from my side, I must admit that I'm not a, uh, I can, um, uh, I have, uh, I, I cannot have a clear cut answer on that specific question, but let's say that I cannot imagine that somebody cannot opt out. It would be very, very strange if from the commission side or from any national level side in the European Union, at least, that there would be no opt out uh, possibility. I mean, the, the very basics of uh, the European data strategy is that the data um, uh, owner stays in control and decides how data, his or her data, can be used. So it cannot be that um, in this case there would not be an opt out and that we would suddenly start uh, using data uh, without, uh, you know, especially very sensitive health data without you being uh, uh, agreeing with it or saying, I, I do not want to participate in this. So if this is not clear in this uh, proposal, um, then maybe it should be clarified at a later stage. Yeah, no, that's uh, absolutely right. Actually, I do not know the proposal the commission proposal by heart but definitely the opt-out principle is embedded throughout the uh, the, the the overall uh, the overall uh, proposal but it's true however that probably this is an area especially around how you empower citizens how you give them the right tools in a very intuitive and really easy to use way to exercise their rights this is a topic uh, that is of the utmost importance to build the trust. Uh, the example that Peya gave us is really, you know, the, is really proving the is really proving the point. It's the element of trust and uh, the fact that actually citizens uh, are uh, feel confident into uh, giving data for for research because they know that they will be used appropriately and lawfully. 
it's, uh, it's an element that uh, should not be undervalued and should be not just a political kind of proposition, but really being something actionable. Actually, that's the... Absolutely. Trust is crucial. And one of the elements of trust is cost-benefit analysis. So the benefit needs also to be clear. The fact that these data are used to deliver something, as they have shown, the number of applications, the number of use cases, the number of basically uh, the KPI on the output are crucial also to gain trust. So it's about understanding the risk and having the tool to manage this risk. Exactly. Exactly. And, and maybe just as a final remark, it's very interesting to see that research uh, has, has, has shown in the European Union that in, on average, a European citizen like you and I are absolutely uh, motivated and, and, and are willing to share their sensitive personal data in the field of health uh, for the greater good. I mean, of course, to get better personalized um, health services, so the primary use, but also for the secondary use for research and innovation and, and making the, the global health uh, systems here in the European Union better. So I think that's also um, something that is really interesting and shows that there is in general trust by the European citizens to go in this direction. Excellent. Listen, we've got more questions coming and anonymization, you know, when you start talking about anonymization, you can never stop. So I'm really sorry, but I'm also happy, as I always say, to stop uh, when there is a lot of discussion going on, because it means this was useful to you. And this is ultimately what we what what this is about. And thanks a lot to all the speakers for the fantastic presentation. The videos will be available on the YouTube channel of the project that you see in the, in the chat and on the uh, main result page on the Europa website. Uh, everything is in the chat, and you will be uh, you will receive a follow up email with more details. So um, thanks everyone. This was really interesting, and I hope we made some progress. Many thanks. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, David.